Hello everyone, you're, you're very welcome here to Kenny's. Uh, we're delighted to have you here today and particularly delighted to have with us uh, Darren Negrifa. Darren is more well known as a poet, but I suspect not for long because her first book of prose, A Ghost in the Throat, has just been published by Tramp Press. It's absolutely fantastic and we're really delighted to have her here and looking forward to, to talking to her for the next while. Darren, to start, congratulations. This is an absolutely fabulous book. You're known to date obviously more as a poet and uh, I'm really interested to kind of know what, what made you go down this, this prose route. Uh, it's obviously a very different road to take and uh, I'm just interested to see what made you, made you do it. Yeah, I suppose when I think about the path that I followed from the poetry towards the book, um, it's very much Eileen Dove's voice that carried me along, you know, that initially I was so fascinated by the poem itself um, and that I kept returning to it over and over again and that it was almost that fascination with the poem to begin with that drew me further towards her story and her life. So really when I think of what carried me from poetry into publishing a book of prose, it's Eileen Dove is the answer, you know. She was the one who led me here and she's the one I have to thank for this book. Yeah, so it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision to, to branch out or to change or evolve or anything? I don't think so. And yet, in some ways I wonder whether um, artistically you become the writer that you are based on the materials that you're given. So for me, the type of writer that I was in terms of writing poetry and that I am in some ways, um, was drawn from what I was given, which was these very tiny little parcels of time. Um, and the impulse to create something had to be necessarily fitted into those little parcels of time. So what I ended up making were these like very intense, smaller parcels that we call poems. Yeah. Um, then as my children are getting a little older and I have these larger parcels of time, maybe it's natural that there's a sense of growth. Well, okay, the, the intense compression of a poem grows a little into a paragraph. And as I was saying earlier today, you know, there are paragraphs in this book that in some ways move like a poem or like a prose poem and that are almost disguised as prose, but that in essence, some of the paragraphs here really are poems, you know, that I was still thinking in that way and making in that way at a craft level. But um, yeah, I think that's really... And, and obviously the focus of the book is Adeline Love, but also Queen Arthur Lyra, mm -hmm. which is obviously a very, very famous poem. And as you say, the book itself, there's much of it is very poetic in nature, mm -hmm. whether it's excerpts from the poem or the movement of your writing or whatever so it's not a it's not a total departure I guess. I suppose not in some ways um, and this book was a pleasure to write you know and I often felt as though I was almost absent in the process that the, the book was being composed or was being written through me you know mm. um, where you I think that's always a pleasure for any kind of an artist where you're so absorbed in the process of what's being made that you're almost temporarily gone and what needs to be made is kind of coming through you. So um, this book in some ways just felt like it was a gift, you know, and, and um, I really enjoyed the process of making it. And it did really feel very close to poems a lot of the time during that. And the book that you arrived at has obviously got a conglomerate of different elements, be they autobiography, history, poetry, literature, Irish language. Um, so it's, it's not that easy to categorise. How, how would you categorise it or, or do you feel that it shouldn't be categorised? Yeah, it's, it's something I found myself thinking a lot about these past few months. Um, and every time I, I think about that, I struggle and stumble and fail to eventually come up with one final category, which is something that I don't envy booksellers about this prospect. The bestseller section. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I suppose what I come back to when, when I'm thinking about that as well, um, 
like life, it's 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 kind of difficult to categorize as one genre. Like there's a certain falseness in in the way sometimes that we shoehorn things into different categories, and uh, I'm kind of I, I'm I'm at ease about that. You know, like um, it's kind of a mishmash, an unscientific mishmash. As there's a section in the book that's titled that. That that's kind of how it felt to me through the process of it. That I, when I was feeling my way around the Queen and around Eileen Dove's life, that there were elements of it that blurred lines all the time. So it felt like the book itself had to blur lines in its own way, you know? Mm. Um, so it feels natural that the book became that kind of an artistic creation yeah. you know it feels true to how the process felt to me as I was exploring yeah, yeah. the material of it and um, yeah if someone asked me what category my life would fit into <laughs> I'd find it hard to pick one you know yeah. so um, yeah it is a strange one definitely maybe we need to invent a new little Absolutely. genre for it but I, I, it's interesting because it, it remains accessible you could say all of these different categorizations and, and somebody might look at it and be daunted by it or be... But it, the book remains very accessible, uh, even given all these categories and, and, and different points of research. Now, I'm intrigued, how did you approach writing it? Was it a, a linear, kind of an A to Z uh, fashion or did you uh, weave it together after the fact? Like a, a lot of my writing, um, my process is very close to dreams sometimes. Like I'll often work in the daytime in terms of the actual writing. But when I'm thinking things through, it's often in that time where between when you close your eyes to go to sleep and when you actually lose consciousness. I'm really intrigued, Darren. Uh, to what extent is your use of the first person uh, autobiographical? Uh, you, it's, it's obviously something you've played with previously in your poetry and that sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, and I'm, I'm just intrigued how you brought that to bear on the new book and how it, you bring the reader along, you reference the reader several times in this book and how it influences the journey that you're bringing the reader on. So I suppose something that's very interesting to me with poetry is to look at the kind of a writer I became from when I began writing and then as I was starting to develop and that that's a process that is very much still ongoing. And um, when I was first coming to poetry, one element of poetry that I was very drawn to is persona poetry, where the speaker of a poem would have a certain distance from what we might consider the eye of the writer sitting down to compose the poem. Um, and I felt in some ways that the more distance that that eye took from the eye who I am going to the supermarket, say, yeah. and writing a list, you know, eggs, fish, whatever. The distance between those two eyes allowed me to explore things that were in some ways much closer to my sense of self. Um, so for a while, as, as I was writing through the books that led me to this book, that distance was very helpful to me in exploring things. Um, as I was coming closer to this book, the sense of those eyes was starting to come, I think, closer together. Um, in some ways, the eye in this book is much closer to the eye that I recognise when I look in the mirror, you know. And with the question that you asked then about, about the reader, it was really important to me to be very open about how flawed that eye is, the eye that speaks um, in this book. Um, and how that I isn't a historian, doesn't have any sense of um, training behind the scholarship that's in it, and that I would open that whole element of how flawed the I is up to the reader and invite the reader into the adventure that this I is going on. So there's a sense of trust there, but there's also a sense of distance there between the I in the presence of a ghost in the throat and the reader, you know, and um, the reader is invited along to observe all the mistakes. And, and I mean, in some ways, I hope that 
what that will create is the sense with some readers that they feel like they can follow this journey and that they can continue it and possibly find out something more, you know. I mean, that would be the ideal scenario yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Um, that some readers might come to this book and think, okay, this person attempted this and this is what she discovered. What will happen if I attempt the same thing, you know? I mean, who knows where it might bring them yeah. or what might be yet to be found. And so to uh, Eileen Dove and, and the Queen itself, um, how much of your focus was on was on her and on the poem? I mean, you've gone to great lengths to to reclaim her through the book, uh, both and, and put her in context, uh, both historical and literary, and indeed personal. And I, I'm just wondering how important uh, was that for you? Mm, it was really important to me. I suppose uh, I feel like some of the work that I did in researching this book drew on scholarship that had been done before me, you know, like Maidna Canarkinig, Angela Burke, Sean Otuma, that there was really extraordinary scholarship there that kind of dropped the breadcrumbs that I was able to follow in terms of trying to develop, uh, whether misguided or not, a sense of intimacy with someone who had lived so many years before us. I, I don't think it's necessarily something that's unfamiliar, particularly to anyone who's done, like, who's researched and written their own family history, you know, that sense of looking into the past, acknowledging that there's a big distance in terms of time between you and a character. And yet the more that you learn, the closer and closer you start to feel to the person. Um, and that part of the process was fascinating to me. So, um, I mean, I, I hope it will bring people back to Eileen Dove. I know that I started to feel much closer to her through the Queen and then through the scholarship and then through following the threads that I followed, um, that it revealed a great richness to her life, to me, if that makes any sense. And um, yeah, it, it was a remarkable journey to go on. Yeah, and by any stretch, she had a remarkable life. She uh, had, yeah. You know, uh, and, and the Queen itself, when you finish the book, uh, which is great in itself, there's an even greater treat at the end in that there's your translation of the poem. Uh, and I was conscious reading it. It seems like an absolutely enormous undertaking. I'm, I'm intrigued. How long did it take you to, to write it because, or to translate it, sorry, because it's, it's, it seems like it must be a huge undertaking. Yeah, it was, it was a long process. Um, and I suppose with me, oftentimes on the first draft of something, I'm like a dog with a bone, you know, where I focus with great intensity on that single task. And then I'll often have several different projects, you know, on the boil at the same time. So I'll flip between them. So I can never really um, say oh, it took this number of years yeah. because like I would go at the first draft of it. In this case, probably the first two drafts at it and couldn't think of anything else with a really focused amount of time, which is described in the book. Um, and then I'll keep going back over and over obsessively. And every time that I was working on that sense of working and reworking um, my translation of it, um, I would read it aloud and I would read, I would read the original aloud over and over again. And every single time, it just gets me right in the chest, you know? It's such an extraordinary piece of work, the Queen of, and, um, we're so fortunate to have it. That was one of the biggest revelations to me as I was researching the book and then writing the book was the sense that just of how lucky we are to have it, you know, and how easy it would have been for it to be lost. Like yeah. so many works of its kind must have been lost. Um, and every time I would read it aloud during that process of translation, just gratitude that we have it and astonishment and awe at how finely wrought a work of art it is. One thing that really struck me uh, in, in reading your translation was the emotion that jumped out through it. Uh, it was really visceral. And I, I wonder, did you, was that something you thought of while you were translating it? Were you trying to bring that out or was there any other aspects that you, you felt were important to bring out? It, it's hard to explain the process of when I'm trying to compose something and I got I get very caught up in it and it just ends up being um, 
it's hard to even articulate it. It just ends up being what it needs to be. So I don't go into the process of translation saying these are the elements that I'd like to bring across through it. These are the salient elements of my translation as opposed to X, Y, Z translation. Yeah. I'm absolutely not naming names. <laughs> I would promise myself, particularly with the poetry. Um, but it just... It just becomes itself. So yeah, I don't consciously have anything in mind um, with it. It is really an act of um, maybe fidelity to my slow learning of the type of character I imagine Eileen Dove was and to the, my experience of reading the poem itself over and over and over again. Like the sense of return, the sense of speaking her words aloud and what it means to, and what it means to return to a poem and to speak it aloud and to feel the rush of those syllables come through your own body, the gasp and the drawing breath and the places where an utterance or a sentence ends, like every single full stop in Eileen Dove's poem. I have considered every single full stop and I have thought about, you know, the choices that were made. And it just, it just has, it, it means so much to me, every aspect of the text. So yeah, to answer your question, I didn't have any um, sense of intention going into it. In fact, if anything, if I'm completely honest at the start, when I was first embarking on the translation, it was more a sense of resistance was my main thing because so many people have translated before and there are a number of those translations that I have huge admiration for and really enjoy reading the translation side by side with the original poem. And um, the resistance would have come from the sense of what, what can I add? And what that was gradually overcome by was the sense of almost helplessness that like, I have to. Yeah. I have to do it, you know, I have to. Recurring in the book, Darren, is the phrase, this is a female text. Would you mind explaining what that means and, and why it's there so, so frequently? Um, the, the whole book... The whole book began with that phrase, this is female text, which I came to think of as kind of a refrain you know, it's a refrain, it recurs. Um, it became really important to me um, before I even began to write the book. I remember so vividly when it first came into my head, I, I had been to visit Kilcray with my daughter um, and had uh, wrestled her into her car seat and was driving home and she had uh, fallen asleep. And as often happens when I'm driving, there's something about the momentum, I think, that sometimes like a phrase or half a phrase will come to you. Um, and this phrase came to me, this is the female text. And it just kept repeating and repeating and repeating on a loop. But I didn't know what it meant. Like, um, I didn't, and that was the question. That was my biggest question at the start was, what is a female text? How can a text be gendered anyway? Like it was literally like the, the statement came first and then all the questions followed it. Um, so a lot of the elements of it recurring as a refrain throughout the book um, involve me attempting over and over again to answer that question. What does this mean? And that for me is part of the real enchantment of trying to create a work of literature is sometimes you don't know where something comes from. It comes from elsewhere, I think, not to get too mystical now. <laughs> but the process of writing a book is a process of trying to figure things out, asking yourself questions that you don't have the answers to, but you hope to figure them out. Um, and that, for me, was an example of one of those, of yeah. one of those um, elements. and. Um, this is a female text. I'm not sure I still know what it means. All I know is that that was, in many ways, what began the book for me, because this is a female text became a question that I had to answer. 
and it re- it began when I was driving away from Kilcray where Arthur Lear is buried and where's one of the places that Eileen Dove recited the Queen at. And by the time I got home, I ran into the house to jot it down because I just knew I had to figure out how to answer this question. I didn't know it would re- lead me to writing a book. I didn't know what it meant. I knew it had something to do with the Queen now. So, um, yeah, it's mysterious. Like, so much of this is mysterious. The Queen, uh, it's one of the most famous and lauded books of the 18th century. Uh, but although Eileen Dove's poem might be in the textbook, she herself is quite often not. You know, her life is, is eclipsed, really, I suppose, by her, her far more famous uh, nephew, Daniel O'Connell. Do you see your book as a way of bringing her back into the general consciousness, or is that not really the purpose of it? Yeah, it absolutely, yeah, I guess so. Um, like, I feel like, like, I don't feel I have to do the work of bringing her back because she is back. Mm. Like, she doesn't feel like she's gone to me. I know that might sound kind of strange, like, but she feels very much alive to me. Um, and it's like a constant presence in my life every day and has been for a long time. Um, so I suppose what's maybe, what's maybe unusual is the sense that um, I'm willing to own up to that. I think a lot of people maybe have these private ghosts that follow them around and that they've invited into their lives and that feel like a living presence. Really? Um, I think in some ways, like, and particularly those of us who are quite bookish, you know, there are certain characters that remain with us, or maybe, you know, maybe there's a person that you're, that you know well when you're a child, a grandparent, or, you know, that there are certain people who aren't currently alive, but that we think of very often, and that are, become nourishing presences in our lives, and um, I suppose, rather than consciously trying to draw people's attention to Eileen Dove is more of a statement of the fact that look, this is my ghost. Mm. How's your ghost getting on? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so she, yeah, and one one of my ghosts, I should say, <laughs> <laughs> there are others. Um, but yeah, no, she feels like she's just there to me. So to a certain extent, I feel like it would be a foolish endeavor for me to try and decide to consciously bring her to people. Um, when in fact all I'm doing is kind of saying like, look, this is this, this is who I see when I'm looking around yeah, here, you yeah. know. And and I suppose lockdown uh, left you more time with your ghost. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm interested because having talked to a number of different authors, everybody seems to be handling lockdown and the COVID crisis differently and that some people have been able to write more, less, they've had more time or less time. Um, how have you found it? Have you been able to write? Have you been writing? And, and, and yeah, how's your experience of it been? Yeah, it's it's a strange one. Um, it's a strange one for me because like like a lot of people, you know, like I have I have responsibilities at home that I have to attend to. And um, um, like I have schooling for children to do now these days, whereas before it was very kindly taken care of <laughs> by uh, their school. Um, so I have less time in some ways, but I'm also extremely fortunate to have a very supportive partner. And um, a lot of lockdown for me has been a matter of tinkering with um, the the ways in which I had gotten used to making my work and um, trying to find other ways <laughs> of getting that time, which isn't unfamiliar to me because um, I've always fitted my work around other people's needs. Um, I never had the experience of um, being a writer without having small children to attend to, so it's not something that is strange to me. But um, I have been writing um, a lot, yeah, I have been writing a lot, Um, and I think that And I have been writing prose and poetry, um, and and I feel almost bad saying it because I know that it's really it's really difficult um, to find the time to do it. But as I say, 
you know, I've always tried to find a way to thrive in, in difficult writing circumstances. So I suppose I'm kind of used to finding weird moments here and there. Like, this isn't as strange for me as for someone who was used to having eight-hour days in, an, in a home office or something. You know, I'm used to kind of like, well, I have five minutes now before whatever. Yeah. Well, reading the book, it's remarkable that you, you found any time because it's certainly a busy <laughs> home life. It is, it is, and I'm very, I'm very lucky to have such a busy life and, and so many um, positive things <laughs> um, and so much to do. Yeah. I wouldn't be idle now, yeah, so I, I have plenty to keep me going. Um, but yeah, no, I have been, I have been writing during lockdown um, and I, I think that I'm very um, lucky as well because I was at the early stages of just beginning to do research and, and thinking into a new prose subject, not a book, but prose subject um, before all this started to happen. And that for me is kind of an area where you're so excited that you can kind of keep galloping through it even if things are hard because your energy is high on it yeah. and you're interested to find out what you're going to figure out next. That's so I was cool. very lucky at the point, say, in a project that I was at um, already. And, um, yeah, that has continued, definitely. Yeah. The Irish language, it's obviously a big theme throughout your work. I mean, your first couple of books were written in Osgaelga. You translated some of your own poetry from, from Irish to English. And although you don't need to be able to read Irish to, to, to read and enjoy this book, it's nonetheless a theme uh, running through it. How important is it for you and for your work? Yeah, I mean, God, the Irish language is just an ordinary part of my life, you know. I'm, I feel very lucky in the way I came to it that Irish was never a language at home when I was growing up, but that my parents sent me to a school, a great Gwale school in Ennis in County Clare. Um, and like the other Gwale school around the country, it was just presented as a normal fact, you know. It was just... Um, it's Tumadachas, which is a Martian education, so it's literally like you bring a four or five year old into school on their first day and the teacher talks only Irish to them. And children are sponges, so they just pick it up. So that was, my, from day one, my experience of the Irish language was just that it was ordinary, you yeah. know. And so it's an ordinary part of my life still when I speak it. Um, Yes, when I take a step back and think about it, yeah, I'm I'm really proud that we have it. And I feel very lucky that decisions that were made on my behalf when I was small mean that I can speak it. Um, and I wish everyone had that opportunity. I really do. Um and in terms of in terms of this book, um I I'm really glad that there is so much Irish in it. So um I suppose any time there is an element of Irish in it, it's that it's fitcha fucha into the text, like it's interwoven. So, yeah. I mean, like a person who didn't have Irish could definitely read the entire text and understand it. And at the end where the Queen itself is featured with my translation that they're side by side, which I think is a beautiful element of the book's design by Charm Press. And I was so glad with the way Marcia set them side by side so the reader can look back and forth between the Irish and the English and there's the sense of it being like an echo you know where your eye is looking back and forth and I really really love that about it that it allows people to come to the text and to see the Irish there and that Irish is represented there within it um in terms of Irish in my life like I always think I always think of it like a styra bio you know like that's one version in Irish for it for the word escalator and apparently the reason that it made its way into Irish was in a very natural way with um, some people who had Irish who were in America and saw an escalator and were saying you know styra bio a living stairs a stairs which is alive and it just seems the perfect metaphor for Irish for me, you know, like because you step onto an escalator and you're carried along, you know, you have this kind of Ouroboros of the mechanism of the escalator going around and around and that some of it is this unseen depth, but the steps come up and they carry you along on them. And those steps for me feel like the words in Irish and the language that I've inherited. And the fact that I can come along 
and place myself on it and be carried along by words that you know my ancestors have been saying and feelings that they've been expressing going back centuries this feels like like that feels like such a source of richness very ordinary richness but like deep richness in my life and i feel so lucky to have it and um and so delighted that it can be represented so beautifully in this book you know um and if if I didn't have it, I don't think I would have been able to come to Eileen Dove's life and to her work in the same way because I would have been accessing it through the other translations that I was coming to and that I wouldn't have been able to attend to her voice as closely yeah. as, I, as I did. Like this, what I've often thought about, what I've often thought about with Eileen Dove is the sense of one woman speaking a poem into the afternoon in which she happens to be standing and another woman 300 years later turning her ear to it and hearing her voice there's something so powerful in that for me you know and i feel very very lucky that when i hear her voice that i can hear it and understand it you know um and we're so fortunate that irish has survived and is so alive as it is now because it feels alive to me like i know it's imperiled and I know that there are certain dangers, but it feels like a living thing to me. It's alive in my body. It's alive in my children's bodies. It's alive in everyone who talks Irish to any of us. Um, and I just think it's a beautiful thing and we're very lucky to have it. Absolutely, here, here. Uh, and we're very lucky to have your book as well. I mean, uh, it's really a triumph. Congratulations on it. Uh, and, and, and we're delighted to have you here. And I wonder, just before we go, if you wouldn't mind reading a, a little excerpt from it. Yeah, Please. sure. It'd be a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Tomas. Much. Thanks for having me here, no, Kenny. Okay. Um, so as I was saying earlier, one element of this book was that I really wanted to invite the reader along with me and to open up my process and just how flawed it is and how ordinary it is, you know. Like, I mean, it's I'm not coming to this as um, a person, a very learned person of impeccable scholarship. I'm very much coming to it as just an ordinary person who's learning the skills it'll take to listen to Eileen Dove and to find out about her life um, and learning those things as I go along and kind of like shambling my way through it and hoping that the reader will come alongside me. So the piece that I'm going to read is just a short little piece and um, it's at a point where before I started to translate the Queena and before I started to try and find out more about Eileen Dove's own life, um, one of the first things I was drawn to doing was seeking out the different translations that had already been made of the Queen. So what that involved for me was um, trying to source a lot of books, some of which were out of print, and um, reading very carefully, the, like this is such an artist now, but the English that people had put on it, <laughs> you know, like on Beer Levy Karhachar. And so this part that I'm going to read takes place with... Um, me trying to pursue some of those translations. Look, it is a Tuesday morning and a security guard in a creased blue uniform is unlocking a door and standing aside with a light-hearted bow because here I come. With my hair scraped into a rough bun, a milk-stained blouse, a baby in a sling, a toddler in a buggy, a nappy bag spewing books and what could only be described as a dangerous light in my eyes. I know that I have a six minute window at best before the screeching begins. So I am unclipping the buggy fast, faster now, and urging the toddler upstairs. No stopping. I peek into the sling where tiny eyelids swipe and sleep, plonk the toddler by my feet and, eyes darting around in search of the librarian who once chastised me, I shove a forbidden banana into his fist. Please. I whisper, please just sit still, while mammy just, just. I tug a wrinkled list from the nappy bag, my fingertips racing the spines. Just two minutes, I think, just two. 
the sling squirms, and the baby rips an extravagant blast into his nappy. I smile. How could I not? And yank the last two books from the shelf. I am grinning as I kiss the toddler's hair, grinning as I hoist my load sideways, step by slow step down the stairs, with one gooey banana hand in mine and a very familiar smell rising from the sling. This is how a woman in my situation comes to chase down every translation of Eileen Dove's words, of which there are many, necessitating many such library visits. Such is the number of individuals who have chosen to translate this poem that it seems almost like a rite of passage or a series of cover versions of some beloved old song. Many of the translations I find feeble, dead texts that try but fail to find the thumping pulse of Eileen Dove's presence. But some are memorably strong. Few come close enough to her voice to satiate me, though. And the accompanying pages of her broader circumstances are often so sparse that they leave me hungry. Not just hungry, I am starving. I long to know more of her life, both before and after the moment of composition. I want to know who she was, where she came from, and what happened next. I want to know what became of her children and grandchildren. I want to read details of her burial place so I can lay flowers on her grave. I want to know her and to know her life. And I am lazy, so I want to find all these answers laid out easily before me, preferably in a single library book. The literature available to me, however, is mostly uninterested in answering such peripheral curiosities. Still, I search because I am convinced that there must be a text in existence somewhere that shares my wonder. And that's it. Thanks very much. Carmela Mahat.